It's never the offseason in women's basketball, especially here at Locked Women's Basketball and the next. In segment one, we'll address Angel Reese and Rakia Jackson's exclusions from our top prospect rankings in segment two. We'll give an update on the latest in Anisha Morrow's recruitment. And then finally, in segment three, we'll have transfer decisions from former Duke star Celeste Taylor and arguably the best mid-major prospect in the country in Kiki Jefferson. We'll discuss that and more on today's episode. Locked Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wale for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Welcome. You are locked on women's basketball. My name is Sonny Grissom, a Saturday host, covering the WBA draft and college basketball at large. Thanks for making Locked Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember, Locked Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. I'm joined my co-host, M. Adler. M is a BR of Seattle Storm and heads out written coverage of the WBA draft at thenexthoops.com. So earlier this week, we released an extensive article on thenexthoops.com, diving into over 20 of the top prospects in college basketball. And our list got a little bit of feedback to where we didn't have, notably, Angel Reese, Rakia Jackson, Camila Cardoso, and Haley Van Lith, who are commonly seen in the top 10 on mainstream mock drafts in 2024 specifically. So our scouting approach is a little bit different to others as we put more of an emphasis on median outcome, upside possibilities, and also just different developmental pathways and scalability of players um, from college to modern WNBA concepts. So I want to open this up to you, M. What is your biggest concern with Angel Reese's WNBA transition, transition at the moment? Yeah, I think this is a pretty good example of the trend we're talking about here in general in terms of what makes us different from the way other people might be seeing them. With what you're talking about with respect to player development, there's a certain way you approach player development in terms of long-term projections that differs from, you know, just is this transfer going to look good going from, let's say, Providence to uh, UCLA. There's a, there's a difference between that sort of thing and saying, like, you know, someone who is good in college, how does their game actually work at the WNBA level? And I think the most prominent example um, that I could, you know, come up with in uh, certainly recent drafts that will be fresh in people's mind, you know, you, we have Nas Hillman. Nas Hillman was one of the best players in college basketball at Michigan. She scored, I believe it was 60 points in a game two years ago. Um, and she was just ruthless as a scorer. She was absolutely one of the handful of best players in the game for her uh, basically three veteran years in the country, as far as I, I can remember. And this past year in Atlanta with the Dream, she was probably about replacement level for the WNBA. She, is, she was just a rookie, so I'm not, we're not saying that that's necessarily what she's going to be going forwards. But there's limitations to what you can do in the WNBA compared to what you can do in college basketball. The athleticism of the talent around you gets higher. The speed of the game gets higher. The concepts get trickier. The things that you're able to do within a scheme, within a system, they get tougher and they get tighter. And for some people, that means that you know, you're able to uh, sort of adapt and different parts of your game get highlighted more or certain things get diminished a bit. And sometimes it means that entire parts of your game kind of go away because because suddenly the threshold for being good at something has dropped below where you were before. And I think that's where we are looking at with Angel Reese, or at least that's where, you know, you, me, and uh, uh, Lincoln, who couldn't be here today, that's where we're at with, with Angel Reese, is that she is a phenomenal college basketball player. I don't think any of us would have left her off uh, our uh, our All American ballots last year. I certainly didn't off his mind, but when it comes to looking at what her future at the WNBA level is, the the first thing we basically need to ask is what is your position going to be, so that we can start evaluating you within a certain context. And for Angel Reese, it could be a four, it could be a five, depends on you know de- defensive skills for the most part, unless you're going to be a point. Determine where you're going to be on defense. And when I look at her defense, you know, she's she's had good rim protection skills going back to Maryland. But at her height, you know, you would not prefer her to be guarding 
your 6'7 Brittany Grinder. You would not prefer her to be guarding your 6'5 Shakira Austin at the WNBA level. So the question is, can she defend well enough in space to, he- to hold up at the four? And I, and I think there's an issue there. I think they're also, when it comes to her offense, you know, people have said that, you know, if, if she adds a jumper, things could be taken to the next level. If she adds post moves, things could be taken to the next level. And I agree, but I think we're starting from a different baseline in our evaluation because I think most of the way that she does end up scoring here is sort of where Nas Hillman was, you know, eight feet from the basket, back to the basket and doing, you know, unstoppable post moves and athleticism. Angel Reese is, you know, that unstoppable athlete who mostly operates around the rim, but everything starts with a sort of 16 foot, I shouldn't say everything, but a lot of her, you know, most creation in offense comes from, you know, your 16 foot, your 16 foot face up and drives. And she's really good at those. She's really good at finishing them and drawing contact and getting to the line. But the issue is at the WNBA level, you're going to have a heck of a lot more help defense that are uh, stunning and on you. You're going to have a lot less respect out to 15, 16 feet. People are just going to be waiting for you to come to the rim and they're going to be stacking up. And you need to have some sort of of action to open up the rim if you're going to do that. And right now, I don't know what that is for her. And another player in that vein is Alyssa Kunain last year. She was, I, I remember there was an article where someone was like making a case for her as like a lottery prospect. And that's what you'll see sometimes. These extremely good college players, like even Kunain, we're not denying she was an elite college player at NC State, but translatable skills matter. And that's what separates Angel Reese from someone like Haley Jones, who also couldn't shoot, but it's the value added skills that she has. Like in, in, in um, Haley Jones's case, it's the transition creation ability, the playmaking. It's also the defense is more sound, um, projectable in terms of like p- positionality. But when you're looking at someone like Angel Reese or even someone like Rakia Jackson as well, where they're sort of tweeners, they can't really shoot either. Jackson a little bit more. Uh, that's why I'm a little bit higher on her. But also both players are tweeners. And that's what makes it tough, especially on this side of kind of a list where like if you told me Rakia Jackson and – Angel Reese were depth pieces. Like I'm not saying they're both not good, like eighth, ninth players on the bench, but our list is top 20 prospects. And these are players we think have like star upside at best, but they also have like median outcomes of being like rotation contributors. Absolutely. And I think, and you know, we didn't necessarily receive a lot of feedback this far down the list. A lot of people, you know, and that's just how it is in terms of, you know, some of the media landscape. Um, today is there's a certain there's a certain sort of audience who's going to uh, read to a certain level of depth. There's a certain audience who's going to read a little more in depth what what you're writing. There's a certain um, level of audience that is going to you know look at the headline graphic and comment and move on. And someone we really receive a lot of comment on because it was farther down um, was uh, you know I'll use as like a foil to Angel Reese uh, Yarden Garzon, um, who is who is a freshman in Indiana. And certainly Arden Garzon was not as good of a college player as Angel Reese was last year, not trying to argue otherwise. Um, But when we are talking about projectable skills here, you know, one of the reasons that we are generally a lot higher on shooters than than other, you know, public science scouts are is because when we're talking about projectable skills, the easiest skill to project to the next level is a good is a good outside jump shot. It's the most scalable thing. It's the most easily um, insertable thing into any offensive scheme for the most part. And so when you have someone who was the same height as Angel Reese in, in Garzon, then being able to shoot is a heck of a lot easier to fit into any given lineup and any given scheme than driving from the 17 foot, uh, driving from 17 feet and finishing through defenders that are going to be a heck of a lot stronger and taller and more agile laterally in the WNBA than they were at the college level. And the thing, the other thing that balances this out is again when we talk about someone like our zone, we're talking about someone who I believe was 19 this year or, or just turned 19 as a freshman in college, as compared to Angel Reese, who is a rising senior. So she's gone through three seasons of college basketball and it's her game has, uh, de- has, has clearly developed and she's gotten better over time, but there's a difference between someone sort of overhauling the parts of their game and really adding huge chunks of it. This is what we've seen with Caitlin Clark over the years in terms of just going from someone who could get off excellent, excellent deep shots, create perimeter shots, and 
uh, drive and kick to someone who was doing even higher level playmaking and was able to drive and really leverage her strength. And then she got better on defense. We're adding things every year, adding new things and polishing things you're already good at. Angel Reese, for the most part, has stayed within a similar game um, as she was, you know, for the past couple of years, but just added a little more polish to it. Instead of starting from 10 feet out from the basket, she's able to start 15 feet out. And again, that's good, but you need to have some sort of counter. You need to show some sort of pattern of development because it, the longer you go on as a basketball player, the harder it gets to say that something new is just going to materialize. And I think that's one of the spots where we sort of differ in our process, I think, a lot from a lot of people is, you know, taking a sort of a sort of more philosophical player dev look and not just saying like, you know, we would like this thing to be added to her game. She is working on it. Therefore, it's going to happen. And that's, and that's the idea of like outlier development is something, especially on our median outcome scale, outlier development. Like if someone outlier development comes in their game, they're going to exceed our list. Like that's just something you can't really project. Mm -hmm. So if we can't really, if they have, there's no basis that she's shown that she can, she can shoot. I believe she took one three, like all of last season or something like that. And the jumper itself doesn't look good. I mean, in terms of outlier development, like you're talking about, like, the same thing with in terms of like if Angel Reese adds a jumper. Well, if Olivia Miles adds a jumper, then like we wouldn't have had her we wouldn't have had her median outcome as a future all-star. If Olivia Miles adds a jumper, her median outcome is at least a one-time MVP in the WNBA. She would have been a lot higher. But when you look at someone and the shot and the shot hasn't actually improved over time, and you look at the form and it's not something that you know you can easily say, well, yeah, we we want that to improve, but we can't say it's going to based on looking at it. You, you have to wait and see because that's just not a thing that you can project. Yeah, we, we don't scout based on hypotheticals. Like that that was evident by what our, our board was last season compared to someone like Stephanie Suarez, where these hypotheticals that we just haven't seen on film, like even even with Letitia and me here, we're not saying she's going to shoot. She's never really shown it. So that's mm. just another another thing. Um, but after the break, we'll dive into another prospect on this list is Camila Cardoso, who – You'll see pretty high because she'll be taking over South Carolina with Aaliyah Ball. We're back. I'm your son. I appreciate you making Lockton Women's Basketball your first listen every day. So let's kick it off here with uh, Camila Cardoso, South Carolina post player. So what is like your biggest concern with her game translating? I think there are actually surprisingly different places where you, me, and Lincoln are a little bit more reserved on her game. You know, I think... I know Lincoln has his concerns on the offensive side. For me, you know, I have concerns sort of all around, to be frank. For me, one of the biggest things is, you know, we talk about her size and her defensive playmaking at, at that size. Part of the thing with South Carolina is, of course, the way they want to play is super aggressive with the guards at the point of attack. And the guards can give up to penetration a, a, a lot more than sort of your average team or that they would if they were in a different scheme because they're gambling harder on steals and blocks because that they, they have so much light behind them to pick up uh, that penetration and, <clears throat> and help onto it. What that means for the bigs is that they're hanging out back in the paint a lot more than, you know, they would, they're not playing at the level. And for someone like Camila Cardoso, that's a big advantage because you have so much size waiting in the paint and you don't have to worry about navigating space up higher. The sort of flip side of that is at the WNBA level, where most teams are running hedge right now as they're picking roll coverage, it's pretty difficult to survive as just a pure drop big, especially if you can't get to the level sometimes. And one of the biggest things for me that stuck out about Camila Cardoso is just the fact that she doesn't particularly leverage her, her feet and her hips well to move in space closer to the level, even you know closer up by the free throw line. She has a lot of length, and that makes up for a lot of it. But there are going to be, con I don't know what I'm saying, going. There are concerns that I have, not at South Carolina and not in the SEC. I think she'll be fine this year. I think she'll be great. I think she'll be an SEC player of the year contender. But at the WNBA level where you can go four out, one in, and you can bring the, that one and run a pick and roll, there's nowhere to sort of get as much help from. There's nowhere to more easily mitigate the issue of defending in space if you still can't flip your hips and feet well enough. Your length can't make up for that if someone is able to hit a pull-up shot more often than they did against you in college. If you don't have the level of help around you, if the big is a lot easier able to get around you with the dribble or on the roll. 
So a couple people, whenever we released this board, they brought up Tier McCowan's comparison. So I think we we kind of differ on like those players and how they compare. So what would you say is the biggest difference between those players and why it's not really a good comparison to make? I mean, the biggest thing is the finishing, frankly. Like, Jeremy McCowan is one of the best finishers that we saw at the college level for years upon years, and she's still an elite finisher at the WNBA level. And at that beyond elite, beyond elite finishing, she's also an excellent offensive rebounder. But the difference between, you know, her offensive rebounding and someone like Cardosos or someone like Angel Reese, who we talked about before, is – you know, and, and no one measures this directly, um, but it's the sort of rate of offensive rebounds that are coming from teammate shots as opposed to her own. An offense, an offensive board of your own missed shot is a, is is a value neutral board. You know, you missed the shot, you got you got your rebound. Now you have another chance. It's value neutral as opposed to rebounding someone else's shot. It's val- that that is value added. And for McCowan, as a great finisher, she's able to when you look at that offensive rebounding, she's able to actually get a lot of the teammates' misses and be, be able to you know, get putbacks on those. It's sort of just like a very long entry pass was the joke about like some wing shootings last year uh, on the Dallas team. When you're shooting, as Camila Cardozo does, based about 55.5%, and pretty much all of that comes around the rim, that's, that, that's kind of an average rate. And there's nothing wrong with that because if you're rebounding off enough and putting them back, that's still you know, that's still good. That's a lot of chances you're creating and being able to finish, even if it takes you a couple shots. But at that, it's not the same level of value add. And McCowan is someone who, you know, I have my doubts about. It remains to be seen whether that's actually someone you can play big minutes at center and win, you know, in the and go deep in the playoffs. So, you know, if we're talking about a lesser version of that, then, you know, you just have those concerns, but at a higher level. And with McCowan, I know one thing Lincoln mentioned to us was the touch as well. The touch at the rim, mm-hmm. being able to have those post moves to where whenever I'm looking at Cardoso, it just seems like she's us- utilizing her size more than anything. And that's like her best skill as like an offensive threat, which is, yeah, it has value, especially at the college level. But size can only go use, can only take you so far, especially at the WNBA level where She's going to be playing against players of similar size, of similar measurables and athleticism. So even with the McCowan comparison, I don't think McCowan's a player you can have on like a top seed, a player you can play big minutes in the playoffs, can play extended minutes. So if we're, talk- we're talking about a player that is like a worse version of that, I mean, she she, she could be a WNBA player, like similar to these other players. Yeah, absolutely. She could, she could be a WNBA player. But when we're talking about high-end out- outcomes, talking about starter pathways, being able to be a contributor on a playoff team, which is sort of what this list is, that's just not what I project with her. Yeah. And I think and I think that, to me, is very different than – and, you know, we did an entire episode about this before. Um, and then she sort of got better and got more comfortable within their system over the course of the year. But I think that's, I think that's actually a different case – than what we've seen, or I guess in our case, not seen from Rakia Jackson, is, you know, with with Rakia Jackson, it's less, you know, seeing the limitations and and being concerned about how we can project her to, you know, really change her game. As much as, you know, at this point, we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of pro skills. We've seen a lot of things that, you know, if you sort of rebalanced her her sliders, would make us super super high on her skill set. Um, but for us, it's been with her, despite that sort of having this penchant for doing a lot of low efficiency stuff, you know, you, you know, you can see with Rahia Jackson the pick and roll pull up threes that she hits uh, that she was hitting in the SEC tournament. You can see the, the the drive downhill in your inverted pick and rolls, or even in your four or five pick and rolls with her at the four, and it's really enticing. You can see her her process as a finisher around the rim when Tennessee put her in, adv- in advantageous positions. But the thing is. I think specifically with her, at least, you know, as it stands for us at the moment. And the thing for her is it's just how how are we balancing these things? How are we finding the balance between scoring approaches that are going to work at the WNBA level and scoring approaches that just sort of leverage athleticism and leverage um, just going up against significantly worse players? How are we how are we leveraging these two things against each other? Which one are we seeing more often? And there's so many flashes of that WNBA level of approach, but it just is really hard to to look at that and to 
think about how they might get rebounds at the WNBA level when they haven't been at the college level. But, but what that means is, you know, we are, I'm certain we're going to be significantly higher on Ricky Jackson as a prospect than we will be when we finally do the, our preseason rankings than we will be on Camilla Cardoso. You know, it's just sort of what are we seeing and how can we project the specific player development out of this? Yeah, so we'll go to a quick break, and then after that, we'll talk about Anissa Mara. We'll talk about J.C. Sheldon's fit with Celeste Taylor, exciting backcourt there. But, yeah, stick with us after the break. Okay. On Friday, DePaul transfer Anissa Morrow, a Wooden Award finalist, announced her top three contenders, uh, so to speak, which included South Carolina, LSU, and Southern California. So, um, when you're looking at this list, what is like your first initial reaction? Boy, that is a lot of teams that did not score particularly efficiently for most of last year. <sighs> it's... It's certainly an interesting list. I mean, first of all, the first thing it tells us, and this isn't this isn't as pressing a development for us as draft mix than it is for you know us as occasional college basketball analysts. But what that tells us is USC is is, is putting out the bag. We already knew that South Carolina and LSU were putting out the bag. That's how Angel. I, I mean, let's let's be real. That's how Angel Reese got to LSU. That we and South Carolina was advertising the fact that they were you know essentially getting a sort of endowment to all the players who were on the team last year. That's how LSU is in contention for Haley Van Lith, another player not on our board for, I think, even more obvious reasons than anyone we already mentioned. Um, I don't really need to get into that. Um, so the first thing it tells us is, you know, Juju Watkins obviously going there number one overall recruit by ESPN. That was huge. That's huge. And it tells you they're probably putting out the bag and, when it comes to Anissa Morrow having a finals USC, some players that uh, that I know that I've uh, that I've heard considering USC, uh, you know, uh, some players who are you know from the East Coast and have never been to the West Coast, them having and considering USC, it tells us that they are investing and competing on a level with teams like South Carolina, like LSU, like we know Tennessee has been based on you know their transfer history, like um, like I can say that uh, Mississippi State is trying to uh, match Ole Miss in that sort of realm and that's a huge development for them that's a huge development for i guess soon to be big 10 college basketball but it's but it's great for los angeles it's great for that area i think beyond that when we look at anisa morrow's prospect i mean i think the interesting thing is you know we want her to get better from three you know we've both seen huge flashes from her we want her to get better from three and uh, we want her to have more defensive buy-in you know i don't know where you are on how far she has to go defensively i've seen a heck of a lot of flashes and there has to be more buy-in i think usc based on how they played this past year i would probably say there that would be a good outcome for that end of it south carolina i think is obviously the dream for any player when it comes to adding sort of a defensive um, effort, especially when you're uh, sort of on the front court side of things, um, where do you see it on the offensive end in terms of those options? So from an offensive standpoint, are you saying of these three finalists? Yes. So of these three finalists, I would just honestly say USC is my favorite of these three. I think um, whatever LSU has going on, I – I think their direction is a little bit different than I think what Anisha Morrow needs in terms of having like this defensive yeah. structure, because even with Morrow's game, like I think she was like a finalist for defensive player of the year, maybe last season, I think it was, but it's because of her stocks. Like she is yeah. pretty, she's pretty active in that sense. So there's a good baseline there and mm -hmm. that's a good fit at South Carolina, obviously of what they like to do inside, but with having a, high post, low post hub like Camilo Cardoso, it makes things a little bit iffy in trying to project how she will like develop her game specifically. So I think just of those That's three USC. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, of South Carolina. But I think US I think USC um is my favorite of the three. Yeah, I mean I wanna be I wanna be clear before I before I make make these next points. Um because you know I've received a certain amount of uh, pushback for my initial uh uh, look, you know, Twitter isn't real. Nothing you see on Twitter for the most part is real. That's not what's happening. That's not what the news is. That's not what media is. Uh, but certainly it's a nice place to get off initial reactions and to have short conversations, hopefully. That, that, that's, my, that's my forward for saying, 
you know, I made some thoughts on this uh, a pair, just USC's putting up the bag. USC would probably also be a better place for offensive development than the other two, uh, unless South Carolina is overhauling its scheme. You know, I, I think in terms of what you mentioned with Camilo Cardoso as your post-up, you know, Camilo Cardoso is, you know, I'm not breaking any ground here by saying, or getting off any hot takes by saying Camilo Cardoso is not the player that Aaliyah Boston is in almost any sense of it. You know, Aaliyah Boston, much headier player, more active passer, uh, plus, she's a plus passer for a five, really, uh, where Camille Cardoso is, you know, fine. It's not, it's not a weakness in her game. But, you know, if we look at the personnel that South Carolina is running in with next season, you know, you are almost certainly starting Raven Johnson and Bree Hall at, at your one and your two. You have Camille Cardoso at the five. I think the, I think I, I could very well be wrong, but I think the three and the four spots are probably up in the air. But Kayla Full Wise, Kayla uh, Full Wiley. The incoming freshman is going to be, you know, she's really well heralded. She looked awesome in the USA World game uh, uh, that we watched a couple of weeks ago. And so there's a lot of talent there, but it's a very different sort of set of talent than they had before. Even Johnson is extraordinarily different than Kira Fletcher or Destiny Henderson. Uh, Zaya Cook does not, the, that sort of prototype does not show up in anyone that's currently on that roster. Uh, neither does Bree Beal in a sense. Maybe, maybe Bree Hall is sort of like in the Bree Beal sense, but either way, you know, you don't have the other pieces around that that sort of make that a useful and value-added fit. So if the, if Dawn is, you know, willing to sort of overhaul the offense and put it in a different different lens, if you're saying, you know, our, our number one interior scorer is going to be Camila Cardoso uh, right around the rim and everywhere outside of it, we're going to see if, if Anissa Morrow can make something happen, you know, get her the ball with Raven Johnson, have Raven Johnson a three-point outlet, have Bree Hall as a slashing outlet, then... We're talking about something I think completely different than what they ran for the past, you know, really the whole time Aaliyah Boston's been there. And I would be a heck of a lot more in on that fit. You know, I would be very concerned if she went there to sort of play a supercharged Victoria Saxton, Victoria Saxton role, or even really anything approaching the Letitia Mihi role, like, which I doubt there's one Letitia Mihi. But if she was sort of playing that supercharged Victoria Saxton role, I would be really, really concerned because of how special and offensive talent she is and just how much even bumping up her three-point percentage by like 8% would would make her from a very good scorer into, again, like a borderline generational scorer. That's my concern there is, you know, are we talking about the same system, which I think, you know, we, we know what the ceiling there is in terms of that individual front court creation. Or is it going to be somewhere where they're actually like play her more as like a offensive shot creator wing. I think USC probably has the, the, the means for that. They certainly have the coaching for that. Lindsay Gottlieb had one of the, I think best sort of like adaptive game plans in the country last year. And she was not as exactly uh, dealing with stack deck. And so, and so I think that's sort of where I am on the balance there and uh, not to keep this monologue going, going any longer, but I think the, the thing for me with LSU specifically is, and I didn't mention this, didn't get a lot of pushback on this because I didn't say anything about it, but LSU, look, Kim Mulkey doesn't develop bigs, I think. She doesn't really develop anyone to be a WNBA player with with a few exceptions. And look, if the, the best she got was, uh, for, in terms of someone who, you know, had this massive sort of reign of development. You have Odyssey Sims, and then she has, uh, I believe, some injury earlier, early in her career. She didn't have, you know, coaching early in her WNBA career that, you know, probably would have gotten the best out of her. But I think it's fair to say that the only WNBA level post that she has produced is Brittany Griner. And, you know, obviously Brittany Griner is a hell of a WNBA level post to produce, but it's sort of the exception that proves the rule. We have a lot of players who've been drafted pretty high on her and looked really good in college for her, but players that have not added a lot of skill under her under her tutelage. Melissa Smith looked pretty much the same as a sophomore and, and, and a junior, and it wasn't until Nikki Collin came along for exactly one year that we suddenly saw this huge development in her as a perimeter player. You know, with Angel Reese has one more year under Kim Mulkey, and it remains to be seen, but we still are seeing mostly the same player that we saw at Maryland. If you're telling me that she brings in Anissa Morrow, I have a couple decades worth of... A sample size to tell me that Kim Mulkey does not add much to a post player's game. She's going to maximize their ability at college. But, you know, we're talking about someone who is a very good college player and who has the potential to be an all-time offensive talent. We need we need a sort of raw development thing, structure here. And I, I've i never seen Kim Mulkey do that. Okay, so let's talk about what's staking up to be one of the most fun teams next season. Celeste Taylor on Thursday announced her commitment to the Ohio State University, they now have 
Celeste Taylor. They have Celeste Taylor. They also have Cody. They also have someone in J.C. Sheldon. I mean, this is one of the best big threes in the country. Maybe the most exciting big three in terms of just being able to pressure um, in the backcourt, being able to cause so much havoc in, in transition. So when you saw this commitment, how excited were you for this to happen next season? I mean, this is I mean, this is wonderful in terms of just a fun to watch perspective. When we talk, when we look at Ohio State's press, it was obviously excellent last year. And you take out Taylor Mikesell, who's a huge piece in terms of pumping up pace, in terms of pumping up after passing, in terms of activity in the half court, or not the half court, in the full court press, sorry. You replace her with Celeste Taylor, who was one of the handful best and also most versatile in, in a certain sense, backward defenders in the country. She is insanely high energy. Her motor is ridiculous. She, she almost, she, she played a huge amount of minutes for Duke, especially given how uh, Kara Lawson does not like to, to, does usually not like to play players into the mid to high thirties in terms of minutes. Their press is going to have Jason Sheldon with another year of development. She's gotten better as a, she got, she made massive leaps and bounds as a defender from her junior to her, you know, obviously shortened, very bridged senior year. You have Cody McMahon coming in as a sophomore who huge energy, huge, in, huge impact for her, especially for her size and her length. <laughs> and Ricky Harris and Madison Green could not be a more exciting duo atop that press. You know, look, it's going to be so, so draining to score on them. Even if you can score, it's it's going to be so draining. You know, I know you're, uh, I know you're the probably the highest person I know on Celeste Taylor as a prospect. Just like when you think about her in this game, really on both ends and the players that you're playing with, what what are you what are you most excited to see? Uh, from both the on-court play and the development. Okay, first, one thing you didn't mention was they also have Madison Green come back, and they also have Diana Collins coming in. Their guard depth Ooh, is – the, their guard depth is is insane right now. But on the Celeste Taylor front, I think you're looking at a player that's super scalable from a defensive standpoint, different schemes, being able to be versatile as like a wing defender because – if she was in this last 2023 draft, she is easily the best perimeter defender. And so having that base baseline of a skill, she's also an extremely good um, downhill driver, I would say as well. She's got good burst. She's twitchy as well, um, excels in transition. So I think from that standpoint, you're just looking at a player that can do just a little bit of everything in terms of just having a lot of utility, being able to fit different roles. The biggest concern is definitely the shot, but – being in, I think, a better infrastructure with better spacing at Ohio State could could be a lot of fun. I think just to kind of you're saying Ohio State might have better spacing than Duke. Yeah, that's a, it's a very low bar considering. Oh, okay, <laughs> uh, Duke scoring like forty points. I, I'll never forgive him for that. But um, just in terms of the shooting, we saw times where Celeste Taylor would go on like a spree. What, what was that one game? Was it NC State where she hit like five or six threes? I believe. It might have been NC State this season. I know what you're talking about. And, you know, there were times that the jumper looked like it like it was continuing to improve. The jumper basically, both visually and statistically, continuously improved from her, the time she got to Austin and started playing in Texas until at the end of her junior year at uh, her first year at Duke. And then it looked even better. So she off this year and then sort of around the middle of things, uh, not this year, sorry, the middle of January, it suddenly sort of dropped off or it turned to the level that it was at last year. A player with a jump shot at that at the level that you know Celeste Taylor's had the past couple of years, still an excellent college player. Um, lower on her as necessarily a, a, a draft product, just because you know if there's sort of if we've reached the ceiling with the jumper, then you know that the same level it'll be three years in a row. Then there's only so much you can do with the projections, like we were talking about earlier in the show. But I mean, even beyond that, just the spacing that you get at Ohio State, the way you're encouraged to just sort of go downhill or move around and get to the corners, hit the spot, hit the spot ups. There was so much space to work with. There was so much freedom. There was so much to do with that. And especially one of the things that I'm excited about on the Ohio State end of it, not the Celeste Taylor at Ohio State, but the Ohio State adding the Celeste Taylor part of it, is there were a lot of times in the tournament where when the press wasn't necessarily working all too well and they, you know, had to, um, and they, 
weren't generating immediate turnovers and they suddenly had to go, you know, 92 feet to, uh, to score um, once that defensive possession ended. You had a lot of times where, you know, there just wasn't that much going on in the half court offense. And I think that's one of the things that especially doomed them against Virginia Tech was suddenly you your only real like easy shot creating options are Cody off Cody off the catch and JC off the bounce. And you know, if you're adding Celeste Taylor, you're adding another threat who can actually get a shot in the half court. Not the most efficiently at it, but it, but just having one more there as your tertiary option behind one of the best shot creators in, in the country and behind one of the most exciting wing players in the country, especially on offense. You know, I, as a tertiary option, as opposed to the primary option at Duke, that's just going to play up even more. Okay, lastly, let's talk about Kiki Jefferson. She was at James Madison last season, one of the best mid-major players in the country. I had the pleasure of seeing her earlier this season. I was excited to see her in this draft, but looking forward, she'll be at Louisville next season uh, alongside Jada Curry. Thank I know you're. Thank you. I know you're excited about that about that duo of having um, Kiki Jefferson also having Jada Curry. Yeah, Kiki Jefferson, like you said, at JMU, just I don't want to I don't want to say overtaxed. I don't think that would be the right w- way to put it, but. You know, as as a primary option, as their primary option, she was really good. Obviously, and she made UNC. She she looked great against UNC to start the year. She looked even better against Ohio State uh, when they uh, built up that lead early and ended up losing in the first round of the tournament. Having her as, you know, it's actually hard to say whether how the sort of primary, secondary, tertiary options are going to go in that in uh, at Louisville because you know J- Jeff Waltz is going to set up the team. He's he, he's going to maximize the the players who come there. You know, we've seen this in Haley Van Lith as a player who is not a particularly good shot creator. She is a very good sort of stationary three-point shooter, not not a good any other kind of three-point shooter. But you see within the guys at the tournament every year, ACC and um, and the NCAA tournament the past couple of years when she's been their lead guard, she has basically shot huge volume and 50, 50% on really difficult shooting because of the way that Jeff Wolf is able to approach these game plans and get the players in the best chances to succeed. And I think that's got to be absolutely something that Jada Curry and um, Kiki Jefferson you know, noticed. It's hard not to notice. We are going to look at them and we're going to see them in probably the best uh, sort of scheme fit for their talents. And we're going to see two players who are going to be able to play off of each other and who are able to both be shot creators on and off the ball and move well. You know, they have a lot of sort of rising sophomores who were developing and playing more minutes at the end of last year. They have some decent role play vet, role player vets who are still going to be there. I'm very interested to see what this scheme is going to look like. I genuinely can't project anything about it because, you know, we just don't know sort of outside of those two and uh, Olivia Cochran sort of what players are going to look like. And with Kiki Jefferson, it gives you a Where lot you? of versatility. Where am I at on Kiki Jefferson in Louisville? Kiki, Kiki, Jeff, Kiki Jefferson, in terms of how this, uh, you know, helps helps us in terms of her development and in terms of her scout, and also in terms of, in terms of, you know, how do you think they're going to be able to play off each other? So first, I think a big part of Kiki Jefferson's scout is she didn't play many games against like high quality D one opponents this season, and in the games she did have, she was pretty stellar in those games. So having a larger base against major competition was pretty crucial for me. So like whenever earlier this season, I was always like kind of in the back of my head. I'm like, okay, she could be a massive transfer up candidate. And I think with someone like Louisville being able to play in this system, I think she has the versatility to be like a screener as well. I think she has some pretty decent size to have like some uh, wing guard screening as well. Cause I know, there's a lot of versatility with her game because she's also a good shot creator off the dribble, being able to get in those in-between mid-range pull-ups. She can also get downhill, utilize her strength um, in the post, like take advantage of mismatches as well. I'm pretty sure she grades out extremely well in transition as well. So having that up-tempo speed with someone like Jada Curry, who has quick tit, twitch, a really good touch. So I think that combination gives you a lot of versatility in two-player actions and also just being able to flow and like half court sets in general. So thanks to Megan Lutzman's basketball, your first listen today. And I make your second listen game to game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result. Lockdown Game to Game covers every game across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow game to game on Lockdown NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts.